Hello everyone, this is Colin Cordwell, your host of Red Lion Pub Hub. This is episode three. In previous episodes, we talked about ghosts and metaphysics. This episode is going to be dedicated a little bit more to biography, in particular my father's biography. My father was my business partner at the Red Lion. He's been gone 20 years now. He died in 1999. But he had a compelling life and a compelling story to tell. It's my belief when we come back into this life, for quite a few of us, there's the familiar feeling refrain, oh, here we are again. Well, let's get on with it. It's always been my belief that we are spirits having a human experience, not humans having a spiritual experience. As Thomas Wolfe points out to us, a stone, a leaf, an unfound door, a stone, a leaf, a door, and all of them the forgotten faces. Naked and alone, we came into exile. In her dark womb, we did not know our mother's face. From the prison of her flesh, have we come into the unspeakable and incommunicable prison of this earth. Which of us has known his brother? Which of us has looked into his father's heart? Which of us has not remaining prison pent? Which of us is not forever a stranger and alone? A waste of lost in the hot mazes, lost among bright stars, on this weary, unbright cinder lost, remembering speechlessly we speak the great forgotten language, and the lost lane into heaven. A stone, a leaf, an unfound door. Where? When? O lost and by the wind grieved ghost come back again. Each of us is all the sums he has not counted. Subtract us into nakedness and night again, and you shall see begin in Crete 4,000 years ago, the love that ended yesterday in Texas. In many tribes in Africa, there are no written histories, just oral traditions. A child is chosen by sheer dint of the ability of his memory, and he or she becomes the holder and the teller of the history of the tribe. Time has weeded out my family's numbers, and there are just a few of us left. On my shoulders has fallen the task of being the keeper of the family stories. Before a man can tell his own biography, he must tell the biography of his father. Only thus does the boy become the father of the man. This is the story, as it was told to me since I was a boy, of my father's war. There was a book on a shelf in our home that seemed quite old to me. It was tattered and threadbare. It had quite a few photos and drawings and personal handwritten prose. One day my father took it down and opened it up for me and tried to explain the contents to his young son. It was a diary and scrapbook of happenings and memories, his memories, of a large war he had taken part in. It seems he had flown planes, and not just regular airplanes, but war planes. Over the years as I grew older, the stories became more intricate, with greater detail. He would explain how he had chose to be where he was. His was a psychological, archeological dig. And for him, I think, telling me helped set things straight in his soul, which had become severely shaken by the experiences. He explained to me why he had joined the Royal Air Force in World War II. His father, my grandfather, had served in the British Army in the First War and had fought in Mesopotamia and at the disastrous campaign of Gallipoli. He was on the gangplank, evidently, from the boat to the beach at Suvla Bay when a Turkish sniper shot his helmet off his head. He went to grab his helmet and the next bullet went through his wrist, basically shooting his rifle out of his hands. He received another bullet in the knee in a battle on the peninsula, and later was scarred from bayonet wounds from a nightly skirmish with the Turks. It seems one night a Turkish regiment jumped the British trench line and a Turkish soldier tried to bayonet my grandfather. He grabbed the Turk's rifle by the bayonet, slicing his hands open, pulled the rifle out of his hands and bayoneted the Turk with his own weapon. On patrol one day, he came across a young Turkish soldier left for dead by his mates. His legs had been blown off and he was slowly bleeding to death. My grandfather tied his wounds and tried to stem the bleeding. He realized the young Turk was dying so he pulled him up against a wall. He put his arm around him and shared a cigarette with him. 
After a while, the young Turkish soldier slept, passed away in my grandfather's arms. He had siblings who served in the First World War as well. Two of his brothers, and his youngest brother in particular, both serving in the Royal Guards at Passchendaele, the Third Battle of Ypres. Both were killed, and my grandfather's youngest brother was decapitated by a shell. His mother never got over the loss, and you think, how could she? So when World War II broke out, my father came to the decision he was not going to be serving as my grandfather served, on the ground shooting people at close range. He said, if I have to kill people, I'm going to do it at great range. After the disastrous Battle of Dunkirk, we were fortunate enough to get 330,000 soldiers home. My father saw these weather-beaten and bedraggled soldiers coming through the streets. And he said, that's it. On his 20th birthday in July 1940, just before the Battle of Britain, he went down to the Royal Air Force Recruitment Office and signed up. My father decided he was going to be a pilot. So he went through flight training. Uh, he went through all the rigors uh, that a pilot and navigator and air crew went through. He did his flight training up in Prestwick, Scotland. He passed his course with high marks, and he told me of an interesting incident that took place while he was doing his flight training in Prestwick. Evidently, there was a polar squadron flying Spitfires that were stationed there. And one day, my father was flying across the aerodrome in a Tiger Moth training aircraft into the wind, and the Germans decided to attack Glasgow that day. He said the Poles jumped into their Spitfires in the hangar, took off out of the hangar. They didn't wait to get onto the airfield, and they flew underneath my father, in front of him, above him, and behind him. He said, I, I flew through that whole bloody lot with my eyes closed and my hands over my face. Somehow, we didn't collide. He said the Poles were the fiercest pilots he'd ever come across. He said they would have taken off the top of an aircraft hangar to get at the Germans. In September 1st, 1940, my father arrived at North Weald Air Base, just northeast of London. The Battle of Britain was moving towards its height. The day he came, he came up in a steam engine train, and they got out, and they walked over to where the headquarters of the airfield was. They had just been bombed, and there were all these little red flags all over the place. My father said, how nice. They put up celebratory flags for us uh, to welcome the new recruits. As it turned out, the red flags had marked unexploded bombs, and uh, they had to gingerly walk around these things until the UXB group unearthed them. Not knowing where they were and trying to get their bearings, my father asked an airman where the headquarters was. The airman pointed to the top of a hill. He said, it's just on the other side. So they all walked up. When they got to the top of the hill, they saw what was left of the headquarters. They'd just been bombed. It looked like an exploded version of a, a house model. My father walked in where the window had been, and the chief warrant officer, who was the guy running the whole place, screamed at my father, what the hell do you think you're doing? Go outside again and walk through the door. And my father said, well, where's the door? And it, he pointed to two little stubs that had been the base of the doorway. So my father had to walk out the building and go through these two little stubs and enter again. He said the remarkable thing was they had just been bombed. The roof had been torn off and half the walls had been taken away, but everybody was sitting at their desk doing their job as if nothing had happened. My father did a stint at North Weald Air Base uh, for approximately two months. Of the incidents which happened to him there, he claimed that he unofficially was the first man to break the four-minute mile. He was going out on the airfield. Uh, one of his orders was to lay flares out for the night fighters. And he was in the middle of the airfield one afternoon laying flares out when all of a sudden a truck went flying past him down the runway. My father looked at the truck, and he looked behind him, and he saw a Messerschmitt 109 German fighter peel around and drop to within 20 feet of the carpet. All of a sudden, the wings started winking, and he knew that the German was shooting at him. So he took off. He said, as if I was pursued by all the fiends in hell. And from an accurate transcription of his emotions, he, swear, he swears he caught up with the truck going 60 miles an hour. Afterwards, I said, did you jump into the back of the lorry, Dad? He goes, no, I bloody well passed it. 
He said the only thing that left a contrail on that runway that afternoon was him. He said it's amazing what fear can do. And often he said that men, medals aren't given out for heroism, they're given out for self-preservation. Another incident that took place, my father told me, was after they had been bombed at Northwield, a fighter plane came in, a hurricane flown by a Czech pilot, and they sent my father up to the tower with a very gun to fire a flare, telling him not to land there because there were flags all over the field, which marked unexploded bombs. The pilot came in anyway. He landed and he pulled around into the revetment right next to where my father was up in the tower. And my father could look down and he saw a row of bullet holes along the cockpit. And he saw the pilot pull the plane in, cut the engine, and he slumped forward and died right in front of my father. And he said that was very indicative of the Czech people, the Czech character. It was more important for the pilot to get the plane back in one piece so someone else could use it. When he made a comparison between the Czechs and the Poles, he said the Poles were fairly reckless when they fought. When they ran out of ammunition, they would fly alongside the German planes and let the propellers chew up the tail planes, or they would play chicken with the German planes and try to drive them into the ground. He said the Germans were absolutely terrified of them. Later on, Adolf Galland, who was the air commodore in charge of the Luftwaffe fighter forces, yelled at his pilots. He said, God damn it, I want you to fight like the Poles. From Northwield, my father went to Upper Hayford Airfield near Oxford, and he did his night flying training there. He and his crew were tops in their course, and my father said he learned night flying, navigation, bomb aiming, and piloting. His position eventually on the aircraft would be uh, the bombardier and navigator. He had four jobs, actually. He was a co-pilot and the air gunner as well. He didn't wear regular wings like they did in the RF. He had an O with a wing on it, and it was a, a, it was a holdover position from the First World War. It was called an observer. My father was stationed to this one squadron, and uh, he's, an, another group came in, and my, my father asked the station commander, if he could switch over to this other course where he knew all these people he had trained with before. The upper echelon officers believed in esprit de corps, and they said, quite, go ahead, absolutely, be with your chaps. And my father said the course he had been on with the previous squadron were all dead within 24 hours. And it happened all on one Sunday, flying accidents. They ran out of petrol, one, taxi, one bomber taxied into another and killed eight crew right there. Uh, they flew off course and disappeared in the sea. They hadn't seen action. They all died in flying accidents. My father said that was, that was very common. In fact, my father said he flew more missions over England than he did over Germany, just in training. To be in bomber command, which my father went into, took a, a different kind of soul, I should say. Uh, fighter pilots went up. The exhilaration was momentary. You are the killed or were not killed. Richard Hillary, uh, a Spitfire pilot who went to Oxford before the war, wrote a wonderful book called The Last Enemy. And he said he thanked God he was a fighter pilot, that he was not a, a bomber crew where you had to relive night after night the childhood desire to smash things. Prior to signing up in the Royal Air Force, my father studied architecture for four years. He said, I didn't take my final exams because if I was going to join up and fight in the war, I'd probably be killed anyway. So what, would it, what did it matter? And it was his studying architecture, which gave an eye for detail and a finesse for detail, which paid off in his studies as a bomber crew. He was a top navigator, he was a top bomb aimer, and he was a fairly competent pilot. When my father flew in the in the year 1941, five out of every 100 air crew survived 10 operations. My father survived 12. Of these missions, my father told me, some of the most harrowing were when he flew over Hamburg one night and got ca caught in a cone of 40 searchlights. They threw everything up at him that they had, my dad said. It was like being in a birdcage. The anti-aircraft curled around the nose like wires on fire. And when the anti-aircraft stopped, my father said, that meant that a night fighter was creeping behind you. And my father yelled into the intercom for the pilot to put it into a dive. So the pilot put this twin-engine bomber, a Hanley Page Hamden, which was a twin-engine death trap that the English sent their crew up in in the early years of the war, 
At 17,000 feet, my father was in the nose of a plane with a Browning machine gun shooting out searchlights one by one. And it seemed like time had stood still. They came out under 700 feet, screaming, my father said, through the streets of Hamburg, and I was amazed that we didn't rip the, the wings off of our plane. Afterwards, the pilot told my father, I was standing on the control column with a stick between my legs, desperately trying to get the bloody aircraft up. I finally punched the stick forward and the plane came up. Of another mission, my father told me they were over the North Sea. I think they were bombing Rostock. My father was in the nose of the plane trying to get bearings and he saw a shadow underneath him, roughly 500 feet below. It was traveling in the opposite direction of my father's aircraft. It was a Messerschmitt 110 night fighter. My father recognized it. My father didn't say a word to the pilot because he was this Australian guy who was full of you-know-what and vinegar, and would have, he said he would have tried to take the ME-110 on and we would have been blown out of the sky. So he let the German plane slip quietly beneath them. When I discussed it with my father afterwards, I said, you know, Dad, I think the only reason why you're here now is because of the poor aircraft recognition of the Messerschmitt 110. If you look at the dimensions and the outline of your bomber, it's almost identical to a Messerschmitt 110. He must have thought it was another 110 night fighter in the circuit. My father said, you know, I think you're correct. My father used to say my aircraft recognition was better than his, and he was there. Shakespeare once said, he that's born to hang shall never drown. I once asked my father, did you ever come close to dying? And my father thought about it. He goes, oh, my God. We went through about 10 different times where he should have been killed, but he wasn't. My father believed everybody had a time, and when your time was up, it was up. There was nothing you can do about it. And this will be pertinent in later discussions when I talk about his years in captivity. My father told me one time he was up nine hours flying on seven hours of fuel. They had laid mines in, the, in Kiel Harbor in northern Germany. They were coming back over the North Sea, and they were running out of petrol. The pilot kept leaning the mixture back, and my father was trying to find any place eventually where they could land, and they were getting lower and lower over the North Sea, and the plane started losing its height. It came down from about 5,000 feet, and they were halfway over the North Sea, and they were probably about 3,000 feet. They were getting lower and lower, and my father said, I was in the nose of the plane trying to find any place to land. Eventually, we came upon a radio frequency. It was a, a Bolton Paul Defiant night fighter squadron in East Anglia, and on the radio, the tower at the night fighter's base said, we have you on our radar screen. You'll see our beacon presently. Just follow the route you're taking now. My father said the sea was getting closer and closer and closer. And finally he yelled into the intercom, Tony, I see it. Tony was my father's pilot. And presently they saw the beacon and my father said, keep right, right, left, left, right. Because my father said his pilot, for some reason, had a form of night blindness. He said, that's fine, right there. Okay, now lower the, lower the undercarriage. The pilot lowered the undercarriage. They came over. The cliffs were in sight. They Actually, they were so low, they brushed the hedges with the wheels of the plane and hit the runway. They flashed the lights on on the runway. They came down the runway, got halfway down the runway, and both engines died. There wasn't enough gasoline for them to get off the runway. To add to this scenario, uh, my father's bomber was too large to take off of that airfield, so they had to dismantle it and send it back to Upper Hayford. It was all luck, my dad said. It was all luck. He said there were guys whose luck just ran out. One night, my father was coming back from a mission, and they were heading back to the base, and the tower warned them that there was a Junkers 88 German night fighter in the circuit. What they were going to do was flash the lights on the runway. You'd see them, and they were going to turn it off, and you'd just follow where you saw the lights. So my father was, and his crew were making their turns, and they, their time came in to land. They flashed the lights. My dad's plane came down, hit the runway, and went to the end and pulled off. The crew behind them came in, and they had the Junkers 88 night, night fighter behind them. 
and the German blew them out of the sky. My father was one off from being sent to kingdom come. Another mission my father told me he had to fly. Um, there was a concentration of trying to wipe out German bomber airfields since they were hitting London. And so he had to fly to Schiphol Airport uh, just outside Amsterdam. Uh, that was a huge German bomber base. And he and his squadron uh, were ordered to take out a number of German bombers which they came in low, and my father laid a stick of bombs right across a row of Heinkel 111 bombers. He wiped out probably about, I want to say about 10 of them. When they got back, his commanding officer, who he didn't like, said, you guys didn't do it. You dropped your bombs in the sea. He goes, well, believe me, I was there, and I saw us take it out. There were very few funny moments, but they did exist um, when my father was flying and his experiences in the war. One night, he was taking a nap in a hut at the end of the runway, Upper Hayford, one of the pilots came rushing and said, hey, Charlie, Charlie, wake up, wake up. There's a bomb out front. Well, he's, and my father said, well, my name's not Charlie. He's not talking to me. He said, quick, wake up. So my father got out of his bunk and went outside, and a bloody great blockbuster uh, two-ton bomb had dropped down by parachute, fluttered down, and hadn't gone off. He said this thing was 20 feet away from the hut. Had it gone off? I wouldn't be here talking today. He said, fear is an amazing motivator. As he said, uh, going back to when he broke the four-minute mile running down the runway and passing the truck being chased by a German fighter plane, my father said from an accurate transcript from his emotions, he took three steps and jumped over a wall that was about 40 feet away. And he said about 20 officers were sitting there with their noses over the lip looking at this bloody great blockbuster that hadn't gone off. He said had it gone off, it would have wiped out about 300 yards completely. He said it would have left a crater about 200 feet deep. And that's how your life hangs in a thread. Another thread my father hung by, he said he came out of a cloud bank one afternoon right over a German flagship. And he said this ship threw everything up at him that they had. He said, I have no idea how they missed us, but they did. And we crept right into another cloud. And when he came back to the base, my father told his station commander, now I know why they give us brown flight suits. My father would come home on leave, visit his family. They lived in southeast London in the town of Eltham, down near Sidcup. My grandmother had worked in the Woolwich Arsenal in the First World War while my grandfather was at Gallipoli. And my grandfather worked in the Woolwich Arsenal in the Second World War. My grandmother said he used to get occupational hazard pay because it was such a dangerous occupation. But she said the closest he came to being killed was how much, when she found out how much he was getting paid and how much he was giving her. He was getting 50 pounds a week and he was giving her three. And she said, I was waiting with a bloody rolling pin, I was. My father came home on leave one night during the Battle of Britain. He was walking up the hill, he said, and he heard a tremendous racket on the other side. And presently, a Heinkel 111 bomber, German bomber, what came over about 500 feet, streaming smoke from both engines, being chased by three Spitfires. And they said the Spits were weaving in and out, taking turns at shooting at this thing. They went right over his head and disappeared over the next hill. And it wasn't uncommon to see various pieces of wreckage and other paraphernalia from the war. And I was always amazed that people weren't killed from falling bullets and ordnance. My grandmother had her house blown in twice during the Blitz. One time my father came home and there was no front door. And my grandmother said, I was coming in with a cup of tea into the front room and I saw the flash and I stepped into a side area and the front windows blew out and the door and all the glass went past her and stuck in the wall. She said, had I stayed where I would, I would have been killed. And she also told my father that during one of the recent bombings, uh, she went out to make a pot of tea during an air raid, and my grandfather was having a, a, a nap in the shelter, and she went out the wrong end, and she stepped on his face. She said it was the worst night of the Blitz. She said, Duff, bugger. I didn't see him lying down, down there that did I. I trod right on his face. It was worse than old Hitler. He called me everything in a barnyard except a duck. I'll sooner have it go with the Nazi hordes. And it was these times that my father spent with his family that helped keep him going. And he realized, ah, yep, this is what we're fighting for. When my father f 
finished his training. The commanding officer stood in front of all the cadets and he said, gentlemen, each one of you must expect to be a casualty within the next two weeks. And it's funny because I remember that was told me by a man I knew who was a GI in World War II who did his training just north of Chicago at Great Lakes. His commanding officer said to him, gentlemen, you must expect to be killed within the next two weeks. We all looked to the guy at our right and said, that poor son of a bitch. And my father said the same thing. He said, well, it's going to happen to this chap next to me. It's going to happen to him. It's never going to happen to me. But all the near misses my father had, he realized that time was running out. It was only a matter of time. And his good friend Pete Hawkins died on a mission. And he and Pete had gone through training together. They went through so much together. And he received news that on this particular mission, Pete handed a note up to his pilot, and he said, it was covered in blood, and he said, save yourself, I've had it. And he died on that. My dad said, my time's running out. If you can call it a supernatural thing, or a metaphysical thing, but my father had a sixth sense. My father told me in after years, he said, you know, I looked around the mess, and I saw guys who had a very strange glow about them. It was almost like this... It was a light that had settled around them. And I had this strange feeling that the light I was seeing was not good. And these guys wouldn't come back. Uh, it was almost like a premonition. These guys had this light settled on them, and they wouldn't come back from the missions. They were killed. I didn't tell anybody about this, he said, because I didn't want people to think I was cracked. But I found out that other guys had psychic abilities. And I think wartime has an, abil has an amazing ability to sharpen that in an individual. So time went on, and I would see this light in other guys' faces or around their bodies, and they wouldn't come back. And one night, I didn't see it, and I knew it had settled on me. And I had a very bad feeling, very bad feeling. And I was sitting with the commanding officer at dinner in mess one night, and I said, could you fill out my log for me? I don't think I'm going to make it back from this one. And he said, oh, don't, don't think that. That's ridiculous. You know, if you think that way, well, you'll never... You'll never wind up in an air aircraft again. He said, no, I, I've had this feeling for a while, and I believe, I think this is my last mission. And he said, well, I'll fill out your logbook, but nothing's going to happen to you. My father paid off all of his bills. He wrote letters home to his family, all the different members of the family, thanking him for what they'd done, that he was, he was happy to be a part of the family, and uh, he loved them very much. And he posted all of them, and he packed up his kit, and he sent that back, too. At this time, my father was posted to 455 Squadron, which was a Royal Australian Air Force Bomber Squadron and the first Royal Australian Air Force Bomber Squadron to serve with the Royal Air Force in the European theater. It was formed in Williamstown, New South Wales, and my father was one of the few Englishmen, I believe, that was posted to the squadron. Uh, he's certainly one of the few uh, English officers who was posted to the squadron. My father's pilot's name was Tony Gordon, and he was quite a courageous fellow. He had gone to school in England. He and my father had become chums, and uh, they were quite a close crew. Uh, Norman Stokes was the upper gunner, and Ed Holt was the lower gunner. It's important to impart this information as I tell the story later. The next mission that they went on was the night of November 7th to November 8th, 1941. The interesting thing was years later, my father was sitting in the back of the Red Lion reading a book, and I heard him blasphemy. And I asked him what was wrong. He goes, he just discovered what his mission was that night. He never knew the night he was flying. But they were told they were to fly in a triangle between the Pas de Calais in France, Aachen, and Maastricht, and they were to take out any searchlights that they saw. So it was a low-level mission, and flying over Belgium was very dodgy at best. One moment you're 800 feet above ground level, the next moment you're 8 feet above ground level. So they flew uh, around this area for a couple of hours, taking out searchlights, uh, and they were trying to punch a hole in the German defense line of searchlights, which stretched for 150 miles. Flying around, my father said, 
we would shoot at the searchlights, and they would turn them out when they saw them coming, and we would bomb on the filament, and we'd take out searchlights. Winging their way around, they had finished their mission, and they were heading back. My father said, we tried to get below the remaining searchlights, and we saw houses on either side of us when we knew we were flying through valleys. Although it was dark, I, I could look out th through the nose of the plane and see houses up on my left and up on my right. There was a tremendous crash, and the plane shuddered. We started to lose control. The pilot yelled into the intercom, brace for impact. My father climbed out, out from the nose behind the, the pilot seat and braced himself for impact. He said, as long as I live, I'll never forget that sound the tearing of steel. We ripped our wings off. The engines came off. Uh, the, the tail was knocked off the plane. And later we found out the rear gunner was knocked off with it. He was so badly injured that he was repatriated back to England. They came to a rest and my father said, I didn't know whether I was alive or dead. He said, your life truly does pass before you. In the next episode, I'll tell you what happens to my father and the remaining crew. This is Colin Cordwell, your host for the Red Lion Pub Hub. And we will continue with the story and to the next part of my father's incarceration in Germany.